Hello and welcome to Deserted Isolation Discs, a play on words and tribute to the BBC's famous Desert Island Discs podcast. We're Kate Hamer and Louis Saha, the founders of Axis Stars, which is a platform to connect stars from the worlds of sport and entertainment with trusted brands and service providers. Obviously, a lot of our members are at home due to coronavirus at the moment, so we thought we'd work together to bring some entertainment to everyone stuck at home. We hope it's not going to be a super long series, but we have got a good chunk of guests to keep you entertained for a while. Today, we are joined by comedian Sindhu V. Hi, Sindhu. Hello. How are you? I'm very good. It's so warm. It is lovely weather, isn't it? Warm, warm day. I'm very happy the sun is shining. Although we've got Louis here in the south of France, it's probably even nicer there, is it, Louis? Yeah, it's not too bad. I uh, don't try to show off here. So, <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm but, kind of lucky. Yeah, but then you have to go all the way to the south of France. Here I can have good weather <laughs> in the house. You know what I mean? So, hello, Sindhu. It's a pleasure to have you on, on, on the show. Uh, it's really... Uh, it's a, sorry? It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, great, great, great. So how was your, I would say, day, day, you know? What was uh, your routine there, you know, in your confinement days? Because now it's starting to be a bit open or a bit more free in some ways. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, um, so I think in the UK, lockdown started, I, I want to say March 20 or 21. But I mm -hmm. sort of avoided worrying about that by getting corona on March 18. So I didn't care if we were locking down or opening up or mm -hmm. upside down because I started to I started to get very, very sick. And I think the first couple of days I thought, oh, this is corona. <laughs> Easy. I, like I'm totally fine. But of course, what I didn't know is it comes slowly. And then so to be honest, the first 16 days of lockdown, I was unwell. So I, you know, really mm -hmm. was checked out. Um, I don't know what anyone else was doing. I've got a husband and kids. I don't know what they were doing. Someone was putting food outside my room three times a day and leaving. So I don't know what was happening. But then I started to get better. And it took, I think, 22 days was my full before I really came out and started to, like, walk around and stuff. And at that point, I came out. People had been in lockdown for 20 days. And I was like, hey, what's everyone doing? <laughs> and I had all this energy. And I was so excited. People were like, can you piss off like they were couldn't understand why I was so happy so um so with that in mind let's say my routine was much more cheerful than most people because I was like I you know I was coming out of corona I would wake up and I would sit in the garden we have a garden we're lucky enough to have an outdoor space sat in the garden for about an hour and I listened to these different mantras mantras are chants Hindu chants and there's different ones uh, for like there's a Hindu chant for everything. It's like my wrist is hurting. Here's the Hindu chant My ear <laughs> earache. Oh do this chant like and my aunts and my uncles and my dad were sending me all kinds of chants So I would do an hour where I would listen to different ones and I would drink tea specific tea made with cloves and cardamom and um, And I would talk to my husband It was just mm. for an hour and then the kids would get up and we would you know organize their breakfasts and I have two older kids who would organize their own breakfast, but I would interfere with it. Be like, you can't eat that shit. You know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then I think the rest of the time, um, I just downloaded different things uh, with which to do things like this. You know, I made, like, I've not been on Skype for years. I got my Zoom account, my Zoom account, really got myself ready. And, um, you know, when you've got three kids, it's breakfast, lunch, dinner, and in the evenings. Oh, this is one thing we did for the first three weeks, but it's broken down now. We made we we made a system, my husband and I, where each person gets to choose a movie, and then everyone has to watch it. Oh mm -hmm, my! Nice one. Now. Level of discord mm -hmm. in the family was insane, because mm -hmm. our youngest is ten and our eldest is eighteen. And she was like, I want to watch Trolls go on tour. And he was like, bro, I'm going to kill myself. And it was like, you got to do it. Everyone has to take the pain. We are a family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a nice one. So we did that for a few weeks. But that's been about it. You know, nothing, um, nothing too exotic. You've been doing quite yeah. a lot of cooking, though, haven't you? I've seen on your Instagram. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that came a bit later. I think what's happened there is... Um, so it's a little bit... Uh, 
I lost my mother in November. She was sick um, oh. and it was unexpected and it wasn't great, but my mother was a tremendous cook. And my, my mother was very strict. So she'd be cooking with one hand, smack you with the other hand. And it was like, oh my God, how did you know I was drinking a Coca-Cola when I wasn't supposed to? She had eyes all around her head, just in the back sides. So, but the thing with my mother was she cooked every day and she did it out of, she did it partly because she was an Indian housewife, but I think she did it as something that was her duty. And uh, I never cooked. I never cooked. I cooked as a child, but then I was like, I always saw cooking as a, for me, a sign of women being in the kitchen. I was supposed to have an arranged marriage and my mother was like, oh, you you have to learn to cook or husband will be so angry. And I used to be like, fuck that husband. Sorry, can I swear? Yeah, yeah, you're fine. <laughs> Fuck that husband. I think for me, it was a bit of a thing where I, I sort of mistook in my head the idea that if you were a woman who wanted to cook, then you were going to somehow be subordinate yeah, to yeah. activity. Yeah. So I was very rebellious. Now, thankfully, I married a Danish man who genuinely doesn't expect women to do anything they wouldn't do. You know, so my husband was like, you don't want to cook? I don't care. Like, whatever. I, like, it, it was just not an issue in the family. And um, And then... When mommy passed away, I didn't start cooking, but when I was at home with the children and it was this weird lockdown environment where no one's going out, you're just looking at this as a family, you know, and it's unusual because typically the children are in school and I'm at a gig and my husband's traveling, we're a family, but we're not in, we're not together all the time. When I looked at this group of people together all the time, all the time, I thought, who's cooking? It just came out of my mind. I was like, who's cooking? Mm-hmm. You can't be a family at home all the time. And who's cooking? And th- that was the question. I was like, hmm. So then, of course, being myself, I, I, I started out with, re- with recipes like peanut butter chocolate pie because that's where my food instincts are. And my kids were like, oh, yes, please. <laughs> they were like, this is great. <laughs> so I made waffles. I made like ricotta pancakes. I really just outrageously unhealthy food for a very long time um, but I cook every single day it's like it's like a flame in me that's been lit yeah oh, nice I cook every single day and I cook what the children want more or less but I cook with a great deal of it's a weird devotion to the family but also to the things that my mother did which I thought were so meaningless but you know she did her duty towards the family so completely and with so much joy that I only now realize that to be a woman who cooks to feed her family doesn't necessarily have to mean that you're you know non-feminist or you don't want to have a job and all those things that I had in the back of my head. This is very interesting because um, as now I'm, I'm separated and I, I do the cooking for my for my ch- uh, three children and I yeah. actually Children? Really children? enjoy it. Uh, sorry? You look so young. You have three children? Yes, I do. Yeah. How old are <laughs> and they? The worst thing about it is like we were on the, on the table and chatting uh, during the meal. And um, my my son, my eldest one, just say, oh, yes, in, in less than 30 days, I'm going to be 18. And it actually broke my heart. It's yeah. just like, hang on a minute. What? <laughs> It went like this, you know, really. And yeah. the worst thing about it is like my daughter just like killed me even more. She told me, oh, it may be in four or five years, you're going to be granddad. Oh, well, wow. That's oh, a- my God. <laughs> <laughs> How can I say? No, no, no. You're out of the table. You. <laughs> it's, oh, it was it was painful. But uh, I really enjoyed those uh, moments because... I do think that, as you may think that is kind of a duty and, and, and this is what I, uh, I feel, I feel really proud about that. I don't know, uh, it's it just like, I felt like this is a responsibility and then I see the smile and the comments and how, how good it was yes. and all those things are, I, I think it's a privilege. We can't say that it's all for everybody. Yes. Everybody yes. has to, to choose and, and if you feel good about it, do it. There is no judgment from his other people i don't care about who's gonna say what you know i, I, I don't live this uh, this way and the main thing is like the connection that you're creating with your family members yeah. that's it uh end of story it's no about like uh, feminism or masculinism or whatever it is you know it's about family spirit and if you exactly. feel good about it do it exactly and i think that's something you know there's so many things growing up that you 
think you like there's a lot of things you have to learn in life by experience you can't yeah. learn them by like my mom used to say paristhiti bahut kuch sikha deti hai which means circumstance teaches you more than anything else nice you know yeah. and so now when i when i do cook i don't i mean i realize that it's something a and and by the way not to brag but i'm pretty good at it <laughs> um, and the reason i'm good at it is because i only cook what i like I yeah, never that's cook the thing. a meal that to me is like forget it like just you know <laughs> like drink a club soda and go to sleep what are you doing that so i think but it's but i but i think um being in being in lockdown and i'll say this for the record being in lockdown has taught me how to connect with my husband and my children through food which was one thing i swore to myself i would never do ever when when you know i was getting scholarships i was studying i was an investment banker for many years because those were the things that showed that as a woman i was achieving things to connect with your kids and your husband by cooking like who are you some kind of you know 60s housewife from india and now look it's mm-hmm. all come full circle and as my mother would say and now it, that has come and slap you in the face mm-hmm. it slap me in the face but i think it was like wow so i think experience you know there's no other way i would have learned this and i can tell if it wasn't lockdown i wouldn't be cooking 100% i love that it's just like some 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 days you have to challenge your your ways and and whatever thing come from oh i don't want to do like my like whatever i don't want to be influenced whatever and all those things sometimes just build to a human being that you may like build because of people not because of what you really want or maybe are skilled with you know you you have some skills you don't know because you hide them because of whatever you have like uh, thought about uh, at first so maybe at the age of 30 you may say hang on a minute can i hit that uh, uh, vegetable because i used to say that you don't like it and i'm sure that uh, happens to everybody my brother used to eat uh, uh, cheese i couldn't understand he was order a pizza and yeah, he couldn't yeah. all, uh, eat the cheese and i say hang on a minute what are you doing it's like and now he's doing like i don't know we, if you know that raclette It's yes, like yes, yes, cheese, yes. no, like, like yes. it's hitting like. <laughs> so I said, you yeah, see, that's a big change from I. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm I'm asking you as well. What is the actual? Because uh, you obviously uh, with your job you have to be really cultured. But wh- what is now the thing that you look in 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 uh, Netflix or you know uh, videos? Oh man, Last Dance. Yes, he's brilliant. You know, I lived in Chicago when it, in mm-hmm. in 95, 96, 97. So, I remember being at a club and the Bulls were there and seeing Scotty Pippen who by the way is the hottest thing ever. Everyone thinks it's Michael Jordan. No, it's Scotty Pippen, so mm-hmm. hot. And I never really heard him speak because and I never went to a game because I was a student, I couldn't afford it. It was it, mm-hmm. the universities in the south side, but the Bulls were everything. And I, basketball up until university in this country so and by the best sport in the world i don't care what anyone says and as people say don't at me <laughs> it is the best sport in the world anyway so i've been watching last dance but for me it's a real going back to a time when when the bulls were great but we didn't know how great yeah as we mm-hmm. and michael jordan yeah, of course i mean he was like a demigod you know he was flying through the sky the holding the ball like la 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 okay then doing this all the time in the air but you didn't know what it meant yeah because i had grown up with you know the lakers and uh abdul karim jabbar and you know you knew about larry bird and then but i think it was a time in the oh here's here's something crazy i have a friend and basketball is not big in india so it's not a surprise that she didn't know about it but she was studying in dc and she came to visit me in chicago and she went for a walk and she came back and she said i saw the weirdest thing and i said what she said i saw this african american man with like multicolored hair and he had rings on and i think it was a dress and he had a feather boa and he was on his motorcycle i'm like that's then this god man she <laughs> would gather and he was just signing autographs you know and his but she that was what it was like then you know they yeah. were and uh, they were very relaxed but When I watch Last Dance also as a much older person as someone who's been telling her kids you need to study you need to do this someone who came to comedy very late and uh, in comic terms but you know I've had to focus a lot watching that I really have 
it was very moving because first of all, it's part of my, you know, um, early 20s, but then also the kind of focus it took for them to be like that. We didn't have any idea, you know? And then there's this idea that, and then there's this fact that Michael Jordan wasn't nice. Who cares? He was great at basketball. He was not there to, I mean, if I was nice, if I was a nice mother, what would happen to these kids? Mm -hmm. Lying on their ass playing FIFA all day long, you know? Nice. Yeah, so I love Last Dance. I'm watching it. It's very, very moving. Um, but for comedy's sake, now that's very interesting. I don't really watch. I don't watch Netflix and all from a because I'm a comic. I suppose I've started to read a book um, called Calypso by David Sedaris, um, mm. which is he's a, he's a great author and um, he's very funny in his writing. I think he he's in one of those master class. You know those master classes. Every time you watch a YouTube video, Meryl Streep comes up and says, you want to learn it? It's like, get away. No, but anyway, he's in one of them. And he writes about his family, and it's a lot of very dark stuff, but it's very humorous. Okay. That's it's good. So, that. so I've been reading that. What else am I watching? You know, it's weird. There's something about lockdown that's making me very nostalgic. Do you have that? What do you mean? I'm suddenly going back and re-watching things. Yes, it's it's uh, it's a moment. I think uh, everybody is like uh, I would say, take the time. You open the books, you see pictures, you see uh, uh, old videos, and and you realize how good they were. And and sometimes you challenge. You may have not seen it the the right way. You know, you say, hang on a minute, I haven't like totally noticed this. And now you, you know because I think everybody has been put in pause, and everybody take time to re re uh, assess thing. You know, re reassess thing. I mean. And, and, and by that, you have different conclusions sometimes. Absolutely. So we're going back and watching old things. I um, It's funny you talk about letters and stuff. I took out photographs that I've been carrying around with me. The first one is 1947, something from my parents. And then, mm. so I took from 1947 to 1997. Because when I was getting over Corona and I couldn't walk because of my breathing, I used to sit and I archived these photographs. And oh, nice. I had to I had to Amazon a magnifying glass to see what was going on and you know there's some cousins I haven't talked to in like 20, 30 years and so I found their WhatsApps through my dad and I sent them a picture oh, and they were so stupid back I was like no wonder I haven't fucking talked to you for 30 years you moron I <laughs> their number to take you immediately are like oh I know like you connect in a weird way um, you know and it, it's it's I, I don't know. I feel like there's been lots of different parts of me that have not been able to meet in the same room because I've been busy and because I've been living my life. And I've now gathered up all those parts. Mm -hmm. I found a photograph of a little boy, like super tanned, so super dark little boy with short hair and a kind of a smile. It was like quite faded and a kind of a smile and this T-shirt I recognized so I sent it to my dad. I'm like, who's this? He's like, it's you. It's like, what? What is this? He's like, yeah, you know, your mom never wanted to cut your hair because it was like, never took you to the salon because it was a waste of money. So she would just, I'm like, dad, I literally look like someone you would give money to on the road. He's like, yeah, we used to think the same thing. I was like, oh, great. <laughs> Quite literally, all the parts of me that have not met for a long time have gotten into a room. And I think out of that has come a desire to go back and uh, watch Robert De Niro, Midnight Run. Like I haven't even thought of that movie for I don't know how long. Um, there is something about that. So I guess that's what I'm doing, sort of. Uh, there's also a show, I don't know if you'll know it, Louis, but um, Kate will know it, Midsummer Murders. Oh, yeah. What is that? I, it's, okay, it is the most kitsch murder show. How do you explain it? How do you explain it? It's okay, it's set in an English village, which really you would never find anywhere in the real world, but it's set in an English village. If everyone in that village voted for Brexit, you know they did. <laughs> yes, I don't mind because it's so idyllic and the characters, there's Barnaby and Troy and the murders. Louis, you know, they're very English murders. So, for example, there's a fair who has the best turnip, you know, and then the person who's murdered is murdered with a giant turnip. It's so stupid. It's so good. But it's kind of, how do you explain it, Kate? How do you explain it? think they shouldn't have any population left because of the level of murder that happens in this <laughs> small you location. Everyone else. Yeah. Every, so there's a small village. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so anyway, so I've gone back to watch that because when I first came here to work, I studied here briefly and then I went to America and then I came back and I um, got a TV after a long time because I never had time to watch TV. And I used to think, you know, like I knew shows like, for, I didn't know any English shows. I'd been living in America and I was a student. And students, I didn't have a TV. So what was it, you know? And there was no smartphones and Netflix. So I came and I thought, well, what can I watch that's, you turn on the TV and I didn't have Sky. You yeah, know, yeah, I didn't like, have, just had to, and ITV. And I remember the first time I watched Midsummer Murders, I thought, what is this? <laughs> it's the most fascinating. It's like, you know, Agatha Christie, right? Yeah. If you take Agatha Christie and take all the intellectual bits out <laughs> and make everyone live in saint mary's mead and miss marple is not even smart and people are getting killed with turnips you have made so much i was like i am anyway i love it so we've been going back and watching those because my husband also being not english he's fascinated but he's like where the fuck is this place i'm like i know it's in corston he's like where's corston i'm like i don't know i don't know so we've been doing a lot of that um and I know that, I don't know if this is going to help with comedy, but the thing about comedy, though, is depending on the kind of comic you are, you're never thinking about the comedy. You're just doing your life, and then it's time to go to a gig, and you think, you know, you have intuitions about what's funny. Mm -hmm. and then you work those out on stage, which is tricky because there's no stage to work mm. things out at the moment. Have you been doing any video stand-up and stuff? How, how do you find that with no audience reaction? Well, no, I've been doing a lot where there's 80 people on Zoom. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. so do they all have their sound on so you can hear them laugh and stuff? You see, now, you see, this is how you know you're a techie kid, to ask all the right <laughs> questions. Because basically, I did a couple where the promoter was very new to it. So everyone had their sound on. And it was like in a gig when people are coming in and out and no one has sat down yet. That yeah. was the whole that's like doing a gig in India in a restaurant where people don't give a shit and they're still eating and talking and you're like, so my mother told me I had no one care. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is like that. Uh, the, the, the thing that really helps there is to get, like to have a few whiskeys before because they don't give a shit what's happening on the screen. You're like, I got 10 minutes, I could deal with this. <laughs> that's the other thing we've been doing is buying a lot of Japanese whiskey because I'm really putting the whiskey away at the moment. <laughs> um, but then a couple of promoters knew what to do. So they knew... First of all, 80 people show up, so that's a good number on yeah. the screen. Yeah. And then what they do is they know to leave some of the sound on. Okay, nice. Some laughter. But also it's kind of unfair because uh, there's also comments on the side. And I didn't, so, I didn't realize the first time that there's three pages of Zoom. I right. thought, I don't know, this looks like 80 people. But there was someone saying nice things. I couldn't see them. And then I was like, oh, wait, let me find you. And it was flipping pages, and it was a bit crazy. A lot of the early gigs like this were just like chats, you know, and that's not stand up. That's fun, but that's a different, that's not a gig for me. Yeah. That's like, you know, it's a two way street. Like you're asking me questions, I'm answering. The, the gigs where I have material that I want to try, which I was trying in February, mm -hmm. March, you yeah. know. So well, I then, guess yeah. it's tricky as well, because I think if I watch comedy on TV, Although I might think things are funny, I don't laugh out loud. Whereas if I'm in a comedy venue watching a stand-up, I do laugh more. So I don't know if I was watching it on a screen, if I'd just kind of be like, huh, yeah, but not giving the proper... Yeah, exactly. And I think that's why the promoters of those gigs that have worked have talked about that. And, they've, and it's so nice. The audience tries to make it like a gig for themselves. Like they'll turn out their lights and they'll have their beers. And you really appreciate that they're doing that. You know what I mean? But um, yeah, I think I think we're going to have to make it work. Mm. You know, I, I mean, I feel lucky to even have those gigs to try material. Uh, but you're going to have to make it work because this is what it is for the moment. This yeah. is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So what do you Definitely. think about maybe like doing things like in the parking lot, some like places where the sound is reproducing in, in a car for everybody to be at least together and having some kind of, I don't know, like sound repercussion of like, like loves and, and whatever, you know, it's like, because it's very important that someone is loving and he engage everyone to love as well. So it's very important to be kind of like all together. Yeah, I think in the UK right now, that's probably illegal. If I went out into a parking lot and got lots of people to come stand next to each other to listen to me, 
Mm -hmm. but, I, but here's here's the thing. I think that there's a that this is a real moment for people to become very creative with how they do their comedy, and I think some of it is going to be like that. I saw a nice clip of someone out in Australia doing it, you know, and people were like looking out their window and stuff. And I think that's wonderful. For me, that's less of a possibility because I think because I still have the whole household at home, mm. you know what I mean? So I don't have this kind of creative impulse to go to a parking lot. Most of the time I'm like, during the day, the kids are doing school Zoom. By the mm. way, school Zoom is bullshit. They're not on school Zoom. She's on her computer. Every time I walk in, she's like, yeah. <laughs> just click, oh, what, what? she's 10 years old. What, what, mommy? No, nothing. Oh no, I was just talking. And I'm like, where's your class? Oh, we're on a break. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that I think that there are more creative ways, and I think that the moment the lockdown here opens a bit, people are going to start doing that. I probably won't mm -hmm. myself. I also, in a way, have in a way this is I'm lucky because I've got other projects that were getting sidelined because I was on tour and I was gigging. You know, there's a script and there's a couple of um, other written things. So now my agent is like, well, now you don't have an excuse. Mm -hmm. Please. So I'm focusing on those. So I think that's also why I'm not so fast. I have to say, this is a moment where a lot of comics have to decide, are they going to be YouTube comics or not? Mm -hmm. I have so much respect for people who are able to do sketches quickly and then edit them. I mean, ask Kate, on my Instagram, I have never edited anything. It's usually some kid is walking in. I'm just, the camera's everywhere and I'm putting <laughs> sauce in something. But I just think it's fun. And I think that's how most people cook. But if I had to do a clip, I was, I forget it. I'm, I'm out of comedy. That's it. I'm done. Thank you very much. It's been nice. I can't do it. But I mean, it's not for me. So I, and uh, there's a comedian called Kay Curd. And he's doing such great stuff online. And I have, you know, everyone has their moment. And I can't pretend to be everything. But you can always evolve. Then there is like some like yeah. step step by step, you know. Because when I remember like uh, Rio Ferdinand, for example, it was the first one in the dressing room, like using his Twitter and all that, and I couldn't understand. And basically, when I had that kind of like uh, challenge to write a book, and I wanted to really like promote it in some ways and have like some kind of like understanding how far he went, you know. And oh. I used it and I say, oh, and actually now I'm on Instagram and, and so everyone has, has the opportunity to evolve. Actually, yeah, evolve, yeah. And I think for me, the biggest, and that's absolutely right, and I, and I think someone once said to me, who said this? I can't remember who told me this, but they said it. What I do remember is they're not very bright. That's all I have a memory, but I don't know how they said something so wise. They said it's truly intelligent people are the ones who know how to change. So, and I agree with that. And I think for me, the biggest difference has been that I am now very aware that to connect with my audience, I have Instagram and I think about it. Yeah. You know, and it's easy because we've got this dog who's so ugly, he's cute. It's like, I don't know what's happened there. It's like <laughs> one 60 degree thing. Basically, you know, we have a dog already who's very handsome and lovely and he's old. He's, he's a yellow Labrador and he's very statesman. Yeah. You know, and he's like a kind of pedigree from the English Kennel Club. And then my husband, for whatever reason, said in January, I think we should get a puppy. And in January, I was still in shock from my mother having passed away so suddenly. So I was like, I don't care. Like he could have said, let's get a dinosaur when I have mine. Uh, but I do love dogs much more than him. So we got this puppy, you know, and he wanted a French bulldog. And I was like, yeah, nice. they're overbred and he was like no that's the dog I want and so we said fine because we were scared he would change his mind because he's not much of a dog person so we went to this place a couple of hours outside London this lady had them um, and the mother was not very French bulldoggy she was more like a Boston Terrier she had longer legs and she would had a natural delivery which means she wasn't overbred so I was going to throw that I was like okay great and then there was nine puppies and now I have been choosing puppies. I have helped my dogs deliver puppies. I get dogs. My husband, never, ever, ever, he looks at all the puppies. There's the smallest one, which is like semi-formed almost. One eye here, one eye here. You know, sort of wandering around. The head is this big. The body is this. The kid's bumping into things. He's like, that's the one I want. I'm like, of your mind? 
And then he said, why? And I was like, because, and I had to whisper because of it. I said, because this dog is going to die in a week. We're going to take it home and it's going to die in a week. And then what are you going to tell the kids? He's like, this one is speaking to me. I was like, oh my God. Because I mean, you know, these dogs, the puppy, and he was small. He was six weeks old. I thought this puppy could die still, you know. And he was deranged looking. You don't understand. He was literally, I was like, ah. And anyway, and then she wanted to give them away quickly and go back to France. So she got her vet to chip them real early. And so we got him at like seven weeks, which is crazy. He was, he was 800 grams, 800 yeah. grams. And I mean, I can't even tell you. So anyway, he's fine. He's great. He's got the personality of a, you know, when he looks at the 42 kilo Labrador that we have, he thinks I'm looking in a mirror. He's like, yeah. No, no, it's true. Those dogs, yeah, that's the attitude, you know, they, they have like a real problem with sizes. That's yep. why they're mostly very aggressive. Yeah. But the crazy thing about him is that he's so little. <laughs> he's so little and he's like, I'm here. And, yeah. he, and so I put him on Instagram. People love him. Okay. And also he's awake, I would say 15% of the day. <laughs> That's good life, isn't it? <laughs> oh, this is... so, no problems, back... no problems. They have no problems. Uh, uh, they only think about food, games, and we have a pool, you know? That's it. <laughs> That's it. That's it. And, um, but they're very affectionate. So he doesn't like to be by himself. And he's still a puppy. So, you know, and the bigger dog, the elder dog is like, fuck this. I am not dealing with this shit. <laughs> like no and the puppy's like i love you 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 he's like this is no so that's great so i basically put him and my cooking which i think is a good way of connecting because i think it's it would be weird for my audience if i suddenly started doing sketches online mm. i mean it wouldn't be too weird but they'd be like what's that whereas me being myself and sort of holding my shit together more or less mm. is kind of it's also what my stand-up is like, I think, right, Kate? Yeah, no, I think it makes sense to just keep the uh, conversation that way rather than changing completely what you do. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I tried on three sets of jeans yesterday and none of them fit, and I was like, son of a bitch. <laughs> and so, you know, things like that, which I just think are real. So, yes, um, so it would be nice to uh, hear a story that you remember that um, helped you um, to realize how tough you were because you managed to, you know, get back on your, onto your feet. It was a very challenging moment, but you you managed to show um, how strong you were, and uh, it's a good example for people who actually experience that. So, I think. Uh, so a moment which was. Hmm. Um. I mean, I have so many career highlights, which are basically me not being able to believe that I've got this gig or that gig or Apollo, but I don't think that's what you're asking. Uh, I think, okay, I think the in a, in a, as a comic, I don't feel like anything has ever been that tough. In life, in general. In life, holy cow. <laughs> uh, I think what things that can be very hard um, but which we have to do is sometimes we have to look at a situation I had to look at a situation uh, and know that the only person in that that could get things done is me and you don't have the chance then to be like but this is too much for me because you have a responsibility basically when my um, my mother had a stroke early last year and I got a phone call and then that evening I took a flight and I went to India and I was with my father in the hospital and my, my mother was never sick so she went from being completely fine one day to having a stroke and I'm very close to my mom and I she was in intensive care I got there everyone was in shock and um, my father said she hasn't spoken you know they don't know what's going on she she wasn't in a coma so I and I went to her and I got in her ear and I held her hand and I said, mommy, if you can, I said, mommy, I'm here now. If you can hear me, squeeze my hand. And she squeezed my hand. So I was like, okay, she's in there. And then the following day she started to come, you know, cause I told her in her ear, I said, dude, I don't have a bunch of days. So you need to just come out of this thing now. So she was squeezing my hand. Cause my, my mother had a great sense of humor. 
And then the next day, she started to open her eyes and she started, she was paralyzed on one side, started speaking from the other side. And I went, and I was very conflicted because I had my first tour starting. And I'm very dedicated to comedy. It's not just a profession, it's, it's a calling for me that completes me in many ways. And I, as, and I have a responsibility to myself as an adult to respect that. But I also have a responsibility as a daughter to be there with my father. I have an elder sister, she couldn't be there. And to be there with my mother, because my mother and I communicated in a way that she didn't communicate with anyone else. So I was in a real, it was very, very hard in those days for me to know. But I thought, okay, the answer will come. Let me just be present here. So the next day I went to her. Um, we could only spend five, six minutes with her at a time. And I went to her and I said in her ear, I said, Mommy, are you, are you afraid? Because I was very afraid. And every time I'm afraid, I used to call my mother. So my mother said to me, it's a little bit, she could only open part of her mouth. She said, I have never been afraid. Because someone who doesn't come to the battlefield will definitely not know what victory is. And I said to her, why are you being so fucking deep? I don't understand. Like, so stressed. I don't, that's not helping me. And she laughed. And it's in that moment, I think, that I understood that I had one choice. And that was to be fearless on behalf of my mother, on behalf of my father, on behalf of myself, because she couldn't really do much with her fearlessness. Mm -hmm. So I made a decision. I made a very, very big decision, which I think was tough, but it was, um, I stayed, I spoke to the doctors, and it was clear that she was going to be in intensive care for another 15 days. My tour was starting three days later. And I'd never been on tour in the UK. I mean, I'd never been on tour, full stop, but in the UK, I'd never been on tour. So I decided that because I could only see her five minutes of the day that I would leave and I would go back and I would start my tour. And I would, after two weeks, we postponed some of the dates. After I think set nine days, we postponed. So while she was in intensive care, there's nothing I could have done. And that was a very tough decision because I think the easier decision would have been to postpone the tour, which no one would have stopped me and I would have stayed by my father's side, but it wouldn't have necess... The thing is, I had to learn how to be fearless for everybody, and from mm -hmm. pretending that being there and crying with my mom and my father was gonna help, it wasn't gonna help. And I really felt that I owed it to my comedy calling to go and do the tour. And I you told... I told her that. I said, Mama, I'm going to go. I said, I don't know. Oh, yeah, I said to her, I said, and so I made up my mind. For the first time in my life, I made up my mind without checking with my mother. First time. And I went and I told her, I said, Mommy, I I, I don't know what to do, but I, I, you know, about the tour. That's all I said. And I, like, I want to go, but, and then she said to me through again, side of her mouth, she said, did you have a stroke? And I said, no. She said, who had a stroke? I said, you did. She said, so? You are fine. Go to the tour. Otherwise, what will happen to the money? <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. But so we were on the same page, and I went to tour. I tell you something, guys. It was the hardest thing for me to leave my mother. But I knew that I had a responsibility to being an adult and to mm -hmm. the things I had invested myself in and that in the future, I never wanted to look back at this time with my mother and say, could have, I should have. I really thought, no, this is it. If something bad happens at that time, I owned it. I cried all the way from the house to the hospital to the airport, cried on the flight. I mean, the, I think the flight attendant thought I was having a nervous breakdown. Mm -hmm. And she said, are you okay? And I said, my mom had a stroke. And then she ran away for the rest of the flight. She didn't come back. But that was a very difficult decision. And it was about growing up. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's, 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 the, the the focus is like when you think that, that there is like so much um, difficulty to take a decision based on like having a bad choice and a maybe a not less worse choice. It's still difficult, you know. But the, the the thing is like you have a say. Oh, 
I know that your, for example, your mother will have love uh, you to do it and enjoy and and be yourself as much as she know that you have like uh, this uh, passion in your belly. As, so this is something is really hard for for people sometimes to just realize and be focused on on the thing that is uh, really important for everybody. You know, I'm sure that's that's yeah, what you. Yeah. The thing is, yeah. I think I think it can be difficult to. Be true to yourself for the things that are your calling in the face of an incredible love you feel for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, a really difficult... It's a, it's, it's a hard thing because sometimes choosing yourself is very hard. Yeah. By choosing yourself, you really liberate everyone else from any responsibility to take care of you. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Uh, yeah, but look, what you said is like in the different circumstances, like, you know, one piece of uh, of uh, comment that uh, Michael Jordan has done in his last dance uh, documentary, it was about like, I have that kind of like um, sensation that I have to do my stuff, you know, I have to be like uh, who I am, but I, I, it didn't feel like he had that responsibility towards people in a way that you have to be a role model or something like this. And he say, I'm not asking you to follow me. Uh, if you want to follow me and you don't like what I'm doing, you know, you should follow somebody else. And that's it. Because I'm good in, in my own shoes. And he has like bloody great shoes now <laughs> with the Air Jordan. <laughs> no, and I mean, I think after that, it was very easy. I went back every couple of weeks to India. I spent five days. And my agents were so nice. The, the, um, the people doing my, we like moved the tour around. But, you know, I brought... 200% to that tour, 200%. I'd never gone on stage without speaking to my mother first. Never, never, not one day in comedy. Um, yeah. And I learned to do that. And then when I went back, I told her, she said, how's the tour? Is uh, Are the people coming all in the hall? Is it selling out? <laughs> but, you know, it, just, it just changed the dynamic. And I think, I think that's something that was hard for me to do. And I don't know if that answers your question in that way, but I think that's been a re that was a really hard thing for me to do. It would have been easier for me to be like, no, I'm going to stay here in India and, you know. But no, I think that would have been a mistake. So on, on, the, on the same note, you know, what is the, your highlight? Some, something that you really can remember and, and really enjoy, like, really big time? I mean... I think the first time I did live at the Apollo, it was mind mind boggling. I mean, I I got a, I, I was so nervous. It was early in my career, from my standards, and I uh, was standing. And I thought, you know, when it comes up under smoke, I thought, oh good, I'm gonna vomit into the smoke. Right? This, <laughs> don't vomit, don't vomit. And then I went out and I told, I said the first thing, and the second thing I said, it really connected, and people just started laughing. And that's like three and a half thousand people. And I was like, I just, everything just clicked into place. And then you're so focused. Um, that was, a, that, that was a huge highlight. I think, to be honest with you, if I, if I can be completely honest, I think for me, the highlight was probably, bef Apollo is a highlight for everybody. So I think for me was when I went, when I took my debut hour to Edinburgh in 2018. And I was at the Pleasance, I was at the in, in, in the attic, and I was so excited. And I didn't have, I mean, I, I, I was not in any way a well-known comic. Um, but on the second day, so the, the before Edinburgh officially opens, my run sold out. Mm. Amazing. And I remember Phil Max sitting me down and saying, look, this is happening, so we're going to put on two extra shows. And then they, when I heard that, I remember, this is probably a highlight for me. I thought, how should I say this? I thought to myself, this is going to happen. I'm in comedy, this is it. I'm, I just knew, I thought, this is it. This is going to happen. It's like sign a contract uh, for the you know. In, yeah, I think in my head I was like, I have funny things to say, and there's people that want to hear it. We're going. Let's go. And I just never, ever, ever doubted after that. Even if I go to a gig now, I never, 
I doubt, I mean, I think I could die on stage, but I never doubt that there's something I'm going to say that's going to make someone laugh. When that happened, that to me was probably a highlight for me. I couldn't understand how this had happened. But it just, yeah, it just thought, I just thought, yep, here I am, Sindhu V is in comedy. Mm -hmm. What is now the, the, the thing that you, you talk about the mantras that you listen to help you focus on maybe one part of your body. <laughs> But uh, let's say we are building a, a Spotify uh, like compilation and what is the, the song that Sindhu is listening to feel good? Oh my God. I listen I... to, okay, so I listen, I have a very, I really only like Prince. Let's just start with that. <laughs> One thing you have to keep in mind, uh, I really only like Prince. So depending on what mood I'm on, I mean, it's Prince either doing this or Prince either doing that, right? So that, that's one thing we have to bear in mind. The second thing that I listen to is I'm actually, after Prince, it's all very, I mean, my kids, you know, they listen to the, the um, I'm a little, the baby, we call her the baby, she's 10. She was explaining to my husband, why being a stripper is not a bad thing because Cardi B is a stripper. My husband sent me a text and said, what the hell is going on? I'm like, well, she has a point. I mean, you know, so she's listening to some Bodak Yellow or something. I'll listen to that. I don't mind. I listen to a lot of rap. I do listen to a lot of rap. Uh, and my son, he has a playlist, which is, which he's let me listen to, which is some of it. I'm like, oh my God. Like, oh No, but a lot of it is there. You know, If you asked me for a list of songs I listen to all the time, um, I have a playlist here, which is my playlist from before I go on stage for the show. And um, let me tell you what's on there. It's very eclectic. I mean, to be honest, I think it's, I think a lot of people are like, what's going on with that? Here's, here's what's on the, play me, on the playlist. Daryl Hall and John Oates, You Make My Dreams. Shaka Khan, I Feel For You. Uh, In Excess, Need You Tonight. Promiscuous with Timberland and Nelly Furtado, Pump It, Summertime Sadness, Fresh by Cool and the Gang, Play nice. That by Train, Humble by Kendrick Lamar, Modern Love by David Bowie, Staying Alive with the Bee Gees, Erotic City by Prince, Me, Myself and I by De La Soul, nice. Crazy by Narles Barkley. I listen to that like, you know, all the time. California Love by Tupac. Um, Effective, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> It's all over the place, but for yeah, me, no. it's very, each of these songs sends me somewhere, and that's where I have to be just before I go on stage, just before they say, you know, and please welcome to, well, just before I announce myself on. Do you and play I, them in a certain order? Is there, what's the like last song you listen to before you hit the stage, or do you play them on random? Uh, no, the last song I listen to is, um, there's a song by Rihanna called Bitch Better Have My Money. <laughs> because the opening of that song is very strong in my mind. and you know what I, I have to say I've sat in so many green rooms where there's so many curated playlists that you know people listen to and I'm always so embarrassed because I'm like ugh mine is very specific and it's that list but I have no way of justifying why it's that list it's just there um, very good and so there's that and then for anyone who's wondering about mantras I would say at a time like lockdown There's um, there's the 40 verses to Hanuman. Hanuman is our monkey god, and mm -hmm. he's very um, he's he's his essence is devotion and bravery, service, service. And the 40 verses to Hanuman are called Hanuman Chalisa, and there are 40 verses about uh, devotion, self knowledge, focus on the task at hand, and fearlessness. Nice. I listen, so I do those 40 verses every day. Mm -hmm. They're great. Check those great. out. Uh, yeah. So last question for you. If you had to pick three people from the present day or history to be quarantined with, who would you choose? Prince. Mm -hmm. um, not because he would ever speak to me because he didn't speak. It was just to watch his work ethic and that being in that, like being at one with your art. Prince, I would also want to talk to him. Like I'd follow him around and stuff, you know, say <laughs> Prince, um, Amitabh Bachchan, who is an Indian actor, um, and this is a picture of him. Can you see that picture? Oh, yeah. That's him. Um, he's been my 
idol since I was seven. I first watched his movie, but also he has a, he's probably one of the most famous people in the world. And he's like very famous in India. He's got like 43 million Twitter followers. Oh. And um, one of the things he said uh, in an interview recently is that um, he said for every movie, I just want it to be part of the movie. I just want to be there. Mm. I, I don't question. I just want to be part of that. And it's what the audience wants that matters to me. And that really speaks to me. Like every time I get any role in anything, I was in sex education on Netflix. I'm just so delighted to be there because I think, look at this experience. Like who would have thought? You know, and um, it also allows me to exercise muscles in my comedy brain. And in a way, making people laugh is a great gift for me. So I get to have that opportunity. So Amitabh Bachchan and Prince. And the third person I would like to have with me, do they have to be like famous people or just any people? No, any, we've had people say family members and all kinds of things. So anyone, it's your choice. Oh, but then if I say these three, what will happen to my husband and kids? They can't be in the room. No, they they're, just... they're gone. I mean, oh. some people have managed to get five or six in, to be honest. So, you know. I mean, they could just be around. <laughs> yeah. They could be around. Because you could it's... do like a one in, one out or something oh. and just rotate them around, maybe. <laughs> um, I think it would be Prince and um, Amitabh Bachchan. And then... Uh, I was, when I was little, I was raised by a Aya. Aya is like a nanny, but not. It's like a lady who lives in your house and she was old and she was Nepalese. And she raised me from the time I was three weeks old till I was five. And then we left India and then she came back when we came back. And um, there's a picture of me on her back. Can you see this picture? Can you see that picture? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's her and that's me tied on her back. She used to just tie me on her back and do all the housework. My mom was busy. My, my, my mom said, I had a depression and I had a job. I had no time for you. I was like, <laughs> okay. Anyway, mm -hmm. Alma, I used to call her Alma. She was there in my, in, in, in my life, but when I was still very young, she passed away. And I never really got to hang out with her with the consciousness of a person who's hanging out. Mm -hmm. A lot of fun. She was quite mad. Uh, she used to, you know, I used to sleep with a big iron knife like a, to kill things under my bed because she said, oh, it keeps the ghosts away. She was illiterate. She didn't, read, she didn't write. I think I'd like her back for quarantine because I would like to just hang out with her and not just need her and suck all the life out of her. Um, and also, I never even knew to say thank you. Uh, things like that. I was little, you know? So I, I, would, I would have her back for lockdown. Brilliant. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining us. That was super interesting. I'm going to go and listen to some mantras. I feel inspired. <laughs> also, listen to a crazy playlist that is completely no reason to be in that order, but do it. Great. Right. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having me and have a good, what is today, Tuesday. Yes. <laughs> See you. Thank Take you care. Much.